Good afternoon, great to have you joining us for the day. Today we will be delivering a boosting on-farm nitrogen fixation impulses workshop. Now, as you were aware, the team, uh, Martin, Ross and Liz, who are joining us live today, we were due to be on the road over the last uh, week. But thanks to the coronavirus, we have all decided to do our bit for flattening the curve and we are now coming to you via the wonders of technology. So over the past week, we've been practicing and practicing. So we're hoping the technology holds up. Uh, we've got a great session for you today and we're really thankful to you all for joining us. So just a bit about the workshop and what we'll be delivering. Uh, the program which we're operating under is a GRDC investment. And the, the full title is called Increasing the Effectiveness of Nitrogen Fixation in Pulse Crops through Extension and Communication of Improved Inoculation and Crop Management Practices in the Southern Region. So a bit of a mouthful there, but overall, we just like to call it Boosting On-Farm Nitrogen Fixation in Pulses. I'd like to give a quick shout out to our project team. They've been great to work with over the past year and a half. Uh, we work with Mallee Sustainable Farming, who are the lead in the project, Bates Ag, Rural Directions, Southern Farming Systems, Birchett Cropping Group, Moody Agronomy, Riverine Plains, Sardi, Trengobe Consulting, Ryder Ryan Research and Ag Communicators. And for those who I haven't met before, my name's Belinda Kay, I'm with the Ag Communicators team. And uh, as I mentioned, it's been great to be part of this research project. Our team looks after the comms and extension outputs, so any resources or further information that you need, you can feel free to contact our team at any time and we'll send you whatever uh, information or support resources you're after. Uh, some of the things our project are up to, we're currently uh, setting up farmer demonstration strips and replicated trials. We do field days and crop walks, and as I mentioned, we're all about the comms and extension outputs. We've got some great resources, and if you'd like to be sent any of these in the post, please drop us an email at the end. We can send you a back pocket guide on inoculating legumes. We've got a, a fairly hefty guide, a, a practical guide on inoculating legumes as well, and we're more than happy to send you either electronic copy or hard copy of these. We're also just launched, well, it should be early next week, a Pulse podcast series. This is a four part series with Liz and Ross, which looks at pre-sowing inoculation, in-season assessment, acid soils and dry sowing. They'll be ready uh, just in time to uh, listen while you're out doing the, the pre-seeding or pre-sowing jobs. And we will send you the link following the workshop. Okay, as far as today's session goes, I just would like to clarify a few ground rules. Um, everyone who's entered should automatically be on mute and uh, we'll do this ourselves so we don't get any, any background noise. Uh, you're all welcome to ask questions and I'd like to thank the people that sent through the pre-questions. We've worked to address these in the presentation. But after each session that Ross, Martin and Liz will deliver, we invite you to ask whatever questions uh, you would like and we'll attempt to answer them as best we can. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and that's so GRDC can have it available as a resource after today. So if you do have to leave early, we can make a copy available to you. And the last one, there have actually in the last week been a few cases of webinar hacking. Should this occur, and we have a uh, unwanted, unwanted visitor on board, our plan is that we will immediately shut down the webinar. And if you could hang out on your emails, we will send you a refreshed Zoom link and then we'll recommence within 10 minutes. We have put in place as much IT as we can to make sure that we are kept as safe as sound, but in case a little uh, Zoom bot gets into the system, we do have a plan in place. So just a heads up there. And my final one is please be kind. So as an online seminar, we can take questions, but we do ask that you give the, the same courtesy to our speakers that you normally would in a workshop and mind your manners and no swear words. So thanks all. Okay, let's get started on the, on the content now. So I just would like to introduce our speakers, Dr. Liz Farquharson from Sardi, give us a wave. Hello, Liz, you should be able to see her online. Liz is sitting with us at Sardi, and uh, she's actually a senior research officer in soil biology and diagnostics. She spent the last 15 years in pulse researching and looking at optimizing nitrogen fixation in the field. Great to have you, Liz, thanks for your time today. Now on to Ross. G'day Ross, give us a wave. There he is, a uh, hive of productivity in his office at Sardi. Look at that, it's all happening. 
Uh, Ross is actually a senior scientist with Zadi. He's worked closely with various pulse and pasture legume development projects over the past 30 years, which have been supporting the development of new inoculant strains and practices that optimise end fixation. He's contributed to the release of rhizobial strains and used in, which are used in inoculants for several pasture species. And Dr. Martin Ryder, last but not least. Hello, Martin. And I can see you've got some musical instruments in the background, so I'm presuming at the end of this workshop you'll uh, take us home. <laughs> uh, so Martin is actually a soil, soil microbiologist working part-time at the University of Adelaide as a research associate, and he's currently working on soil biology and inoculant projects. He spent more than 35 years of research and extension experience in soil microbiology, including beneficial organisms for biological control of root diseases of major crops and rhizobia for end fixation. So there's our team you'll be hearing from today. They've got a cracking lineup. We'll look over rhizobia, how much N is fixed, when to inoculate and products, key constraints, do's and don'ts, nodulation assessment and new developments. You can see we've built in some time for, for questions. And how you are ask these is, if you have a look at the top of your screen, everyone, there's a little green bar, hover over the green bar, and there is a Q&A panel. Simply click on that Q&A panel and you can type your question in and we'll attempt to answer them as we go. So without further ado, I'm uh, going to stop talking and I will hand over to Ross, who will be taking the first session. Ross, it's over to you and thanks again for joining us all. Uh, thanks, Belinda, and uh, Liz is just going to bring up the uh, the presentation for us. Okay, thanks, uh, Liz, and thanks for the introduction, Belinda. Um, so we're just going to begin by just giving a very brief overview of, of what rhizobium are, because that's important to understand how they function. Um, so they are living organisms and they are a bacteria. Um, they're a, a gram-negative bacteria. And what that means is that they don't actually form spores. So because of that, they're, they're quite sensitive to environmental stresses such as high temperature and desiccation. And when they're applied to seed, they're effect effectively applied as live cells. Thanks, Liz. Now, there's many species of rhizobia specific to different pulse crops. And we, we, we just like to reiterate this because we still see some um, confusion um, in the inoculants that are applied to particular legumes and also um, in the decisions that are made um, whether to inoculate. Some people think if they've grown a medic in a paddock, for example, they may not have to inoculate vetch. And that's a misunderstanding about um, which inoculants go with which legumes. So just to run through this, and, and we've highlighted um, um, the pulse legumes uh, in particular. So you can see the two E and F uh, inoculants um, in, highlighted in yellow. And you'll see in the fourth column that they're actually the same species. They're leguminous R and biovarvisiae. Um, the group E does the P and vetch, and the group F does the lentil and barber bean. Now, these two inoculants are different strains of the same species. So they're a bit like, if you, if you like, varieties of apple. It's a, like a pink lady and a Granny Smith, for example. And, and so those two inoculants can be um, interchanged, and they are done so commercially. Um, however, when you move to something like a lupin, or a chickpea, you'll see that the species and the genera of these are totally, totally different. Um, and that's like comparing an apple to a watermelon. Um, and this is why something like a chickpea rhizobium won't nodulate a, a bean or, or a lentil at all. And, and this is the basis of the different inoculant groups. And it's why it's very important that um, the correct inoculant group is applied to the correct legume. So we'll now have a little look at um, just how rhizobium multiply in, in soils. And again, this is just to provide a basis of understanding of where you might apply inoculants and how rhizobium survive in soils. So this is just a, a simple graph, if you like, that takes us through a season. And it's just a log scale on the, the vertical axis of number of rhizobium per gram of soil. 
And the blue line we're looking at is a, what you might call a nice or a benign soil in a rhizobium sense. So it would be a loam soil of neutral pH and low salinity levels. And if that soil had a, a, a history of rhizobium, it might start at the beginning of the season with about a thousand cells of rhizobium. At the break of the season in May, when we sow the legume crop, that stimulates those rhizobium to multiply. And through the season, they continue to multiply and they might go from a thousand up to say a hundred thousand or even a million in some exceptional circumstances per gram of soil. So they're the sort of numbers you look at. The nodules senesce and then those rhizobium will decline a little bit. But because it's a benign um, good soil, um, they'll still maintain at around a thousand to ten thousand cells. The contrast to this, if you're in an acid soil, and that might, be, uh, sorry, a stressful soil, that might be an acidic soil, so below pH four and a half. In this case, you'll start the season with much lower numbers of rhizobium. If your inoculation is good, you can still build them up in the soil. They, they grow along in the close proximity to the legume roots, and they still might reach 100,000 um, when the nodules senesce. But in this soil, um, because it's harsh and it's stressful, the death rate of those rhizobium is much, much greater. And, and so by the, the beginning of the next season, they've dropped off to a level um, below 100 per gram, and that means that soil will be responsive to inoculation and you have to re-inoculate. We previously discussed the different um, types of rhizobium, or rhizobium groups, and so we've got, just looking at some of the broad groups here, we've got lupin, soybean, clover, pea bean lentil vetch, which are the EF group, um, chickpea rhizobia and medic and lucerne. And as I said, they're as different as apples and watermelons. They're also different in the way they, they um, can tolerate pH, bearing in mind that soil acidity is one of the um, key drivers or constraints to rhizobium survival. So the lupin rhizobium, um, which also nodulate Cerradella, are quite tolerant of low pH and they're quite happy at around pH 4. Um, we'll be discussing some of the pea, bean, lentil and vetch rhizobium today. We see those as moderately sensitive or intolerant to soil acidity. So once you start going below pH 6, both their survival and their ability to nodulate declines. And at the, the far end of the scale, the medic and the lucerne rhizobium are most sensitive they tend to be impacted below pH 7. I'm now just going to talk a little bit about um, nitrogen um, fixation and what you can reasonably expect out of a well nodulated productive pulse crop. So this um, first graphic we have up is um, um, of some 23 trials for the field pea cultivar CASPA. Um, across South Australia and Victoria. Um, we're looking at the dry matter production of those pea crops across the bottom axis, which goes from a little over two tonnes to nearly 10 tonnes. And on the vertical axis, we're looking at the amount of nitrogen fixed in kilograms per hectare. Now you can, there's, there's two points to make out of this graph. The first one, if you look at the upper boundary of the data, you can see that the potential for end fixation um, is about 22 kilograms per tonne of dry matter produced. And what that means is that, if, for example, if you look at the 10, 10 tonne um, dry matter, um, you'll see that, and, and go up and then across, you'll see that's fixed around 200 kilograms of N. Conversely, if you go to say four tonnes of dry matter and go up, you can see you can only fix about 80 tonnes of N, uh, 80 kilograms of N per tonne of shoot dry matter. And so that means that the dry matter and production of the crop is very important to maximising um, nitrogen fixation and the overall contribution of N to the system. Having said that, you can see there's lots of dots well below the line. And that means there's lots of opportunities to improve N fixation in the real world. And those dots might, or that, those uh, cases of um, suboptimal end fixation might be things due to things like soil acidity, poor inoculation practice, or herbicide residues in soil. And we'll discuss a couple of those in a, in a moment. 
Um, where is the N in the plant? Well, this is, again, this is from the same data set you just saw, but it's looking at where the N in, in the plant is. And this is just a, a schematic of Casper field P. And you can see, on average, this was about a six tonne of total dry matter production, that these, these plants fixed about um, 132 kilos of N above ground, uh, sorry, contained about 132 kilos of N above ground and 60 kilos below ground. Now you'll see that 71 kilos of that was in the grain. So even if that grain is removed in a good, well-grown crop, you're still left behind with 120 kilos of N. So it's often assumed that after harvest, not much N is, is left behind, but these crops are still putting a very significant amount of N back into the system, even after a good, a good uh, yield. And just looking at uh, across some different crops, um, comparing peas, faba beans, lentils, chickpea and lupin, um, you can see that, uh, again, that the lentils, because of their lower dry matter production, tend to fix um, slightly, less um, slightly less N kilograms per hectare. Um, they're around about 60, whereas if you've got beans, and lupin that produce more dry matter, four and five tonnes, and you, you contribute more end to the system. Chickpeas are an, an interesting case, and we're doing a little bit of work in this space at the moment. They, while they're quite productive, their end fixation in general tends to be lower because the percentage of nitrogen that they fix is less. So that's an opportunity for some improvement down the track. So just to sum that up, um, in terms of optimising your end fixation, um, you need to um, care for your rhizobium to opti optimise nodulation where there is a requirement for inoculation, and Liz will touch where that is in a minute. And you also need to maximise crop production because dry matter production um, is a, an important driver of end fixation. Were there any questions at that point, Belinda? No, no questions at all. Thanks, Ross, for that. That was that was great. I've just checked the question panel. Uh, none have come through for the moment. So Liz, let's just keep on keep on moving. We'll hand over to you for the next session. Sure. So um, I'm just going to have a run through of um, when to inoculate and the types of products that, that you might um, encounter. And so the first thing I want to draw everyone's attention to, which Belinda touched on earlier, um, was the back pucket guide for inoculating legumes. And the reason for that is that every um, single scenario is different. And this um, document will take you through each um, crop of interest to you. And it will run through a little bit of background information on which inoculant group you, um, you need to use on that crop. Uh, it'll uh, importantly, um, it has this box down the bottom with respect to likelihood of an inoculation response. And it'll take you through different um, factors that you need to consider as to whether you have a high, moderate or low chance of getting an inoculation response from applying an inoculant um, for that legume crop. And so in the next couple of slides, I'll talk about some of the, the key um, things we look for and that are in that book that will um, influence that decision. So one of the first ones is the time since the last host crop. And this graph just shows um, why that's an important question. It, it covers um, numerous soils. Each dot represents um, different uh, soils that we've looked at. And uh, on the, this axis, the y-axis, it has the number of rhizobia per gram soil and the year since the last host crop. And this is um, information from, we were looking at um, pea, bean, lentil and vetch rhizobia. And so what you can see is uh, if you had the crop last year, you're likely to have a very high number of rhizobia present. But it, as that um, time since the last host extends, that number will drop off. And when we drop below this uh, 100 um, rhizobia per gram of soil, you have a very high chance of an inoculation response, and that's usually around the four years since the last host crop. 
So that will be one of the questions that you can consider. Um, another one is, are the rhizobia sensitive to soil acidity, as Ross mentioned before? And so this is a graph looking um, at the number of P rhizobia per gram of soil again. It's a log scale. Um, so have 10 down the bottom and 10,000 at the top and soil pH measured in calcium across the bottom. And so what we find is um, above pH five and a half, if you have a history of that crop, there tends to be um, higher numbers of rhizobia present. But below um, pH five, five and a half, there's a steep drop off in the number of rhizobia because those rhizobia, as Ross said, don't survive well in acid soils. So there'll be a range of questions that you can consider um, using the back pocket guide to make that decision. So there's several inoculant formulation types on the market. Um, the most commonly one used, um, used by 80% of growers is peat inoculant. That's been around for a very long time. It's usually applied as a slurry to seed or can be applied in furrow. And that um, tends to be a very high quality and very reliable product. Um, in the last 10 years, a range of granule products have been developed. Um, they differ greatly in both their formulation and their quality, and we'll touch on that further. Um, there's a freeze-dried product available. Um, it has very high numbers also, uh, but it has a narrower um, choice of conditions in which it can be used. So it needs to be sown into moist conditions and not left on seed for um, a very long period. And there's also liquid formulations available for things like soybean. So one of the things you should look for uh, when purchasing your inoculants is whether they have the green tick um, on them, which ensures they've been uh, met the minimum quality standards and been tested independently by the Australian Inoculant Research Group. This green tick is currently available for peat and freeze dry products, um, guaranteeing that high number of rhizobia per gram of product. And uh, breaking news is at least two of the granule companies are working closely with the inoculant testing service to have the green tick available for their products uh, either this year or next year. So keep an eye out for green tick on granules in the next 12 months. So in summary, um, consult the back pocket guide. Um, particularly things to consider are time since the last host crop. Uh, is the uh, soil acidity and is your crop, so is the soil acid and is your crop sensitive to that? And another one that you'll be asked in the back pocket guide is what was the nodulation of the last host crop? Did you have good nodulation last time? And Martin will touch on that later in the presentation. Again, lots of product choice. We suggest looking for the green tick logo. And it, uh, it, with respect to granules, um, try to, to get new granules each year and store as recommended to ensure numbers are uh, as high as they can be. So there's um, several key constraints to nodulation in the field when we actually um, move into there. And the key constraints that we're talking about, we're talking about um, for inoculation responsive sites primarily. And so we're going to touch on acidity, dry sowing and mixing of chemicals and fertilizers. So I'm going to hand over to Ross now to kick us off um, talking a little bit about acidity. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Liz. So I'm just going to uh, explore acidity in a little bit more detail and, and um, look at some of the work we're doing. So this is just a, a graphic um, of some results of a range of trials over the last five years. Um, these are field trials and I'm talking, when I'm talking about pH today, I'm always talking about pH measured in calcium chloride in the top 10 centimetres of soil. And that's um, shown on the bottom horizontal axis. And you can see the trials range between pH 4 and pH 8. And in these trials, we routinely measure nodulation. And in this case, it's expressed as nodule number per plant. And what you can clearly see for, and, and this data set is for um, EF legumes, so beans, lentil, pea and vetch. And these are all inoculated with the commercial inoculant strain WSM 1455. And what's striking here is that across a range of sites, there's a relationship between soil pH and nodulation. And you can see it starts to drop 
um, and dropped dramatically below pH 6. Um, and by the time um, you get down to pH 4, um, it's difficult to find any nodules on plants. They might have one or two nodules and that is insufficient to support both plant growth and nitrogen fixation. One of the things um, we have looked at in, in these scenarios is doubling the rate of peat inoculant on seed. And we have seen um, some very promising results by doing this. This is a trial um, from Wanilla on um, the bottom of Air Peninsula in South Australia. It's a bean trial and it, the pH is in the low fours. And you can see that uh, again, this is the commercial inoculant strain WSM 1455 on Samira beans. And the plot on the right is at the standard rate of inoculation and the plot on the left is at double rate. And you can just see the distance, the, uh, the difference that, that makes the visual impact. And, and we've seen this response across a, a range of trials and Liz will unpack that in dry sowing situations also a little later on. The other thing we're working on is looking at um, selecting some improved rhizobium strains. So I've previous, previously shown you some results for 1455 and clearly it is, it is impacted by um, low soil acidity below pH 5. This is a graphic of some of the results um, across a range of trials, 19 um, field sites with a medium pH of 4.7 and there's five measures we look at and this is what we routinely measure in trials, nodulation, peak biomass, end fixation, grain yield, and a summary of all those measures. And we're looking at um, six treatments here. So we've got um, an uninoculated, which is your light blue bar, and this is all standardized data across the sites. So by definition, WSM, the, the measure of 1455, the commercial inoculant strain is zero, and the other treatments are either better or worse than that in percentage terms. So you can see the uninoculated treatment on average is about for nodulation is about 45 percentage units worse than 1455. So the point there is that if you're on an acid site, inoculate because there is a real benefit um, of, of, of um, getting good uh, inoculation practice and getting some nodules on the plants. Um, however, above 1455, which is the dark blue bar, the next one along, um, you can see that one of our um, selected strains is improving nodulation by a further 57 percentage units. And you can see that pattern follows through the other, the other measures, including a 14 percent gain in grain yield. Now these are average data um, and it, it doesn't occur at all sites, but we get large differences at some sites. And the other thing just to leave you with in the the acidity space is that it's, it's also important to consider lime in these situations. We see the new acid tolerant rhizobium and even increasing the inoculation rate as a tool in the toolbox um, to be accompanied by lime. And the reason for that is shown in this simple picture of fava bean roots that were grown in hydroponic solutions that range from pH 5 on the left to pH 4 on the right. And you can see the impact of that one unit decrease in pH on the bean roots. So we can give you the best strains in the world, you can double the inoculant rate, but you really need to move your soil pH back towards five to capture the benefits of, of those innovations. So just to summarise that, if you're on a very acid soil, standard inoculation practices are not going to optimise nodulation for you. Um, we recommend in the short term that you double the, the rate of peat slurry of the commercial inoculant strain. At moderately acid, on moderately acid soils, that will improve your nodulation. That should be accompanied by a liming strategy and where possible, we would recommend bringing your, your pH up to a minimum of 4.5, um, but uh, five is even a better objective. And we have a, an improved strain in development, which will be released in the next two years, if the data support that case. Okay, I'm now going to hand back to Liz and she's going to um, 
unpack some of the uh, optimising nodulation under dry sowing conditions. Thanks, Ross. Um, so to start with, I'll just say um, we've done a little bit of work in the dry sowing space, and by dry sowing we mean um, insufficient soil uh, soil moisture to cause seed germination. So you may have deep soil moisture and be sowing into a dry layer. And um, sometimes you might sow and it might even be 2% soil moisture, but that's still insufficient for seed germination. So that's what we mean by dry sowing in um, this context. And I guess what we want when we dry sow is we want enough rhizobia still present on the seed or near the seed at the time of germination to confer good nodulation. So how do we achieve that? And I like to think of um, two sides of the, the equation, I guess. How can we optimise um, things so there are sufficient rhizobia left? And what stresses or factors limit and kill off the rhizobia, um, which might be um, making it more likely that we could have an inoculation failure? So on the optimising side, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the next few slides, but we'll look, about, look at things like doubling the rate of heat applied or using high count quality granules um, to deliver rhizobia. Uh, I'll just mention now, we, we think that um, lower soil temperatures uh, help um, facilitate rhizobium survival on seed. So if you can delay um, dry sowing from April to May, um, when the soil temperatures are a little bit cooler, that will probably help. Things on the, the limiting side, it, obviously the, the longer the period dry, um, the, the more likely that there will be insufficient rhizobia present uh, at seed germination. Certainly as you extend beyond one week, two weeks, um, the um, level of risk increases. So if you can see a rain forecast within a two week period, uh, you're more likely to have a success. And the other things you want to avoid when dry sowing is additional stress factors. That would be something like soil acidity, as Ross has just discussed, and also the application of seed chemicals, which Martin will discuss further. Um, and all of these things, as Ross mentioned earlier, we're talking about inoculation responsive sites. So if you're dry sowing uh, onto a paddock that has a good history of that crop, well nodulated in the past, non-hostile soil, you can probably have a good rhizobia population and um, your chance of successful nodulation with dry sowing is much higher. I seem to be having trouble changing my slide. There we go. So in terms of increasing the um, amount of peat when dry sowing, this is just some um, work we did on both lupin and chickpea. This graph shows the average nodule number per plant on the vertical and the, the peat rate applied on seed on the horizontal axis. And so for chickpea, which is the orange line, as we, and lupin the green, as we increased the amount of peat applied to seed up to two times for chickpea and four and eight times for lupin, we saw an increase in the number of nodules per plant. Uh, they both dry sown. Chick lupins were seven days in the ground dry before rain and chickpea was 18 days in the ground dry before rain. This is also the same chickpea trial, so the same data set, uh, the nodule number per plant on chickpea. Uh, the first four bars of the data I just showed you, so the uninoculated and at peat at half uh, normal rate and two times the rate. This is a couple of the commercial um, peats, so all nodulating um, similarly. And then we also had some granule treatments in that trial. And for that particular trial, uh, the three granules that we used, a SARDI granule, a BOSF granule, and I must apologise because I've mislabeled uh, this one, uh, the tag team granule, all did exceptionally well. This is another example of um, that granules can be highly effective if their quality is good. Uh, this is an uninoculated um, beans, uh, standard peat rate on beans, and the high count um, granule that we used that year on beans, all at Winilla. So uh, that was our acidic soil, and it was in the ground dry for four weeks, which is in a very extreme scenario. 
that case, the granules did do well. The problem we've had with granules is um, they vary considerably from year to year and product to product in quality. And so we're really hoping that when the green tick becomes available for some of the granular products, that can give um, growers more confidence that they're applying a granule that has a high count to start with. So I'm gonna pass over to Martin now to um, talk about the chemical compatibilities with rhizobia. Thank you, Liz. So seed applied fungicides are clearly important. Uh, for example, Saudi and others recommend uh, on chickpea that you uh, should use pea pickle tea or equivalent to control ascochyta. And uh, the, this kind of fungicide on seed is also used for lentil and pea. There is information out there and the table on the left. Thank you, Liz. Um, this is in the 70 or 70 odd page book that we advertised earlier through Belinda's slides. Table 5.4, it's about from about eight years ago. That information was put together out of different sources. Um, and we have been doing some research on the various compatibilities or incompatibilities. It's a very common question and because um, there is a need to use fungicides and insecticides on seed. But some of this information uh, we can now expand on. Can you go to the next slide? Thanks. So this is uh, on the Petri dish here, pea pickle tea fungicide on a little filter disc, which is about the size of a seed. And the one that Liz is highlighting there with RR, recommended rate, that's the average amount of fungicide that a, a single seed would see if you use pea pickle tea at recommended rate. And now that produces quite a large killing zone and the cells in that zone are actually dead. We've checked that. Now in soil, that zone won't be as big as that, but it does illustrate the toxicity of the fungicide. We've also used a few different doses there, going up and down from the recommended rate. What we have found so far is that thyram and pea pickle tea, which contains thyram, and there's another product that's equivalent to pea pickle tea. They, these are the most toxic fungicides. And we have also got information from others, uh, including Sardi, that apron containing metalaxyl can also be inhibitory. And in our experience so far, the insecticide imidacloprid or gaucho is not a concern to rhizobial survival. And uh, really what we've seen in lab and greenhouse tests are the um, thyram and pea pickle tea, are the, the fungicides of most concern. So we've also got some field data to back that up. Thanks, Liz. This is a trial from 2018 at Minipa, where we had a very dry start. Um, now I must say that of the treatments we used, we have a nil, we have freeze-dried inoculant, and we have peat inoculant, and we also sowed on the day of treatment with rhizobia, and we sowed a day after, that is, we treated a day before. And normally freeze-dried is not recommended for this situation, so don't be so concerned about the low bars for nodule number per plant for the freeze-dried. But really the key result here is that where we put peat on seed, over the top of pea pickle tea, the nodulation was drastically reduced. Now, the average below one tells you the story there. There's also another graph which shows you the nodule fresh weight. It's essentially the same story with highly significant effects of pea pickle tea, uh, showing reduced, much reduced nodulation. So out of this kind of trial, we're saying separate, try to separate the inoculant from the fungicide. And this could be done via granular inoculant in furrow or a slurry in furrow. Could use freeze dried possibly or peat slurry. And uh, if you aren't able to do that, we recommend minimizing the time of exposure. So, so as soon as possible after adding the inoculant. The next trial shows chickpea 
uh, tested at Malala last year. Now this was a more um, benign season for soil moisture, so we didn't have the double stress that we had at Mal uh, Minipa. So just going back to the Minipa situation, we had uh, two stresses. We had um, dry sowing plus we had uh, fungicide on seed. So at this trial last year at Malala, we tested similar effects, uh, similar treatments, freeze dried, zero hours and 24 hours before sowing. We also included a granular formulation, which was um, the uh, tag team granule. And the results here again show significant decreases where we add the, with the orange bars, where we've added pea pickle tea to the seed. The exception here is the granules, where there is a reasonably good nodulation with both uh, treated and untreated seed with pea pickle tea. So this kind of rating scale at 2.5, we would consider is adequate. So we're not quite at adequate with the best treatments, but we're getting close to, the, to that. So Again, the message here is there's a toxic effect of pea pickle tea and it's showing us that using a granule can be beneficial. So summarizing some of the work we've done so far, clearly seed applied fungicides play a role in managing root and foliar diseases. Direct contact can affect rhizobial survival. Now, we're not finding this for all fungicides, but we're telling you some of the key ones, thyram, pea pickle tea, and also apron and metal axle at high rate. So try to avoid this contact between the chemicals and the rhizobia, or if you can't, minimize the exposure time, which I think may be the last point. And we've also talked about granules or liquid or slurry in furrow. Now, I'm going to just spend a few moments talking about some do's and don'ts for inoculation, given that we're about to go out and sow in the next little while. So if we can have the first one, we've talked about many of these points, so this is really a summary. Do take, account in, uh, take into account the paddock history. That is how long since that legume was grown. Has that inoculant been used in that paddock before? What's the soil pH, especially watching out for acid conditions? Use the correct inoculant group, otherwise you'll run the risk of not having any nodulation. Take care when inoculating pickled seed. Thyram and pea pickle tea are toxic. Metal axle or apron can also inhibit. Apply the inoculant away from pickled seed if possible, or minimize the exposure time. Also, consider using double rate peat inoculant in the stressful situations that we've been talking about. And also, if it's the first time to go into a paddock for a particular legume, especially for chickpea, because you won't have a background that's suitable. Sowing dry conditions are also very acidic soils. And the last do is use clean and non-polluted water for peat and freeze-dried inoculant for making that up. So if you've got highly saline bore water, uh, try to avoid that. Uh, try to use rainwater, or if you must use town chlorinated water, we suggest you let it stand for 24 hours or so to get rid of some of that chlorine before you add your inoculant. Next slide, thanks, Liz. So don't use equipment or containers or tanks with chemical residues, so wash things out thoroughly. Don't mix inoculant with trace elements. We have good evidence that these can be very toxic to rhizobia in a very quick space of time. Don't wait too long before sowing your inoculated seed. Sow within 24 hours or sooner if inoculating seed over your inhibitory pickles. Don't leave inoculant in temperatures over 30, which may not be so much of a concern now that we're at this time of year, but store your bags or packets of products, inoculated seed or liquids at um, less than 30 if you can manage it. 
And also we're recommending not to mix inoculant directly with fertilizers, especially MAP, which causes an acid environment around it. I think that's all the don'ts. Now, um, do we have any questions coming in, Belinda? Well, I've got one here that just says, what is the best method of inoculating? Martin, can we ask you that one? What's the best method of inoculating? Will uh, depend. Now, I suppose I'm going to also throw this to my, my colleagues at SARDI. What's the best method of inoculating? I think um, there is some evidence that peat inoculant has a protective effect on rhizobia. So if you're going into a stressful situation, which we've been harping on about a bit today, um, in some situations we think that peat is going to be more reliable than some of your other products. But as Liz has said, if you're going to sow dry, you should, you've got other considerations. Would Ross or Liz like to say something? Well, I just concur with you, Martin, that um, in our experience across many, many trials, peat um, is the most cost effective and delivers the most reliable um, level of nodulation across a range of environments, even in dry sowing situations where um, it's not a big gap between the time the seed is sown and it rains. Having said that, we have seen some very good responses from granules, um, but in general, they tend to be a little bit more erratic in their performance um, between seasons, between products and on different soil types. But as Liz pointed out, we're hopeful that the um, continuing efforts to improve the consistency and quality of the granules um, will overcome that in the future. Okay, thanks. Uh, and I might, could I just add, could I just add, if you wouldn't mind, um, we, we did briefly touch on the freeze-dried um, inoculant in the different products. Now, um, we, we'd just like to reiterate that that is a very high quality inoculant and it does a great job where it's, it's used under optimal sowing conditions, um, particularly into moist soils. Um, but it isn't suited to dry sowing applications and it has to be um, um, applied and, and sown within five or six hours of application. So a good inoculant, but you just need to be aware of the conditions where it's recommended and that's into moist soils sown quickly after application. Thank you. Just two more really quick ones. Um, Arrival of new 969 inoculant. Can you comment quickly on that one? Um, so we, we have pretty much finished the evaluation of that um, strain in um, southern region. Um, we are being held up a little bit um, by the requirement to evaluate it in Western Australia and New South Wales. Um, we're trying to push for a provisional release next year in southern region. Um, if that doesn't occur, it will be available the year after if the data supports its release. Okay, thanks. And the next one I'll just ask quickly is, is there a commercial rhizobia strain available for Lebeckia? Um, Lebeckia is a, a totally new legume. Um, and it's being released by the Western uh, Murdoch University via John Howison. And there is currently a case being developed for the release of a commercial strain, but I think it is only available experimentally at this stage. So the best approach would be to approach John Howison at Murdoch University. No worries. Thank you, Ross. I'll leave questions there. We've just had another question uh, pop up, which is what is the best time to check for nodulation? And I think that actually flows perfectly into the next session we're moving into, which is nodulation assessment. So I'll leave that question. Martin, I believe it's back over to you. Yes, thank you. We're now going to talk about assessing nodulation. So this is down the track a little. 
uh, we're suggesting that this be done around 10 to 12 weeks after sowing, or you could go a little bit earlier than that, perhaps. The window could be eight to 12 weeks after sowing. So why assess nodulation? So if you've gone to the bother of inoculating, it's probably a good idea to find out whether it's been successful. Or if you've got a poorly performing legume, um, that um, looks like it's lacking in nitrogen, you might want to try and understand what's gone wrong there or see whether you're getting adequate nodulation. And we do have some guidelines about adequate nodulation, which I'll, I'll go over. So we want to really look at, has your inoculation been successful or should you inoculate next time if you're not getting very good nodulation? So, Based on some data from Ross and Liz, we have um, the target of 50 nodules per plant. Now, we've the three of us have been discussing the, these two pictures and we reckon that the one on the left has got 50 nodules or so on a pea seedling and on the right, at least 50, perhaps more if you look at, if you were able to look at the back of that root system uh, on the faba bean. So these are, adequately nodulated plants. So you can form a mental picture or a picture of what that should look like. So this is uh, some data from Matt Denton et al. And this, I'm just checking here, was trial work, inoculation of beans with no background of rhizobia. And I believe it was increasing doses of um, inoculant and looking at the effect of that nodule number per plant goes up across to the right and at the same time n fixed goes up dramatically and of course the bottom left corner tells you if there are no nodules you really are not getting any benefit there's no n fixation going on so the more nodules the more n fixed but there is a curve in this relationship we'll look at now. This is data that Ross and Liz have collected from many field trials. And we're looking at on the x-axis nodule number per plant. And on the y-axis, we've got fixed N uh, per tonne of dry matter. And I think that's probably kilos of N, right? So, you can see there is, well, there is a line drawn through that which tends to tail off, but at around 50 to 60 nodules per plant. Beyond that, we're not, uh, we're getting some benefit, but the major benefit is in getting up to that level. So this is why we've set 50 or greater nodules per plant as a target for the pea, bean and lentil group of legumes. Now chickpea is a different case and we don't have the data yet for this, but our best guesstimate is that 20 to 30 nodules per plant is a target that you should aim for. And nodules on chickpeas are actually of a different kind and they tend to, pure nodules can grow quite a lot larger than the type of nodulation you get on the other legumes that we've mentioned. So we'll move along. The back pocket guide has got some suggestions also. Plus there is a fairly recent, maybe 80 month old tips and tactics on the right there, which is available online. That talks about the process of going out to check for nodulation. There are also three short-ish, maybe three to four minute videos about sampling in the field, preparing samples for assessment and also assessing nodulation. So these are all available online and you can go and have a look at those when you need to later in the season. So really what I'm saying there is go out and sample at several different spots in the field, wash out the root systems carefully, try to bring them back as whole as possible, um, wash them out, perhaps near the home or sheds, or you can do it in the field if you're carrying water. But really you can't see what's going on until you've properly um, dug up a root system as well as you can and tried to preserve it as well as possible. And then have a look at it carefully. 
Usually floating in water against a white background is helpful. So you can see the pink, the desired pink nodulation nodules. Um, I think that's pretty much a summary. Yeah, if you're not getting adequate nodulation, then you really need to ask what's going wrong here or what could you do better? Thanks, I think that's the end of my section and it's back to Ross. Okay, thank you, Martin. I'll just um, round out by having a look at uh, one of the new developments that we're, we're looking at. And this is a development of a DNA test that will um, enable the measurement quantification of rhizobial numbers in soil um, for the EF legumes. So again, the, um, the legumes in that group are pea, bean, lentil and veg. And that covers a fair bit of the, the pulse crop grain in, in southern region. Um, we've been working on this test for 12 months. Um, the, the graph you're looking at is just a calibration curve um, looking at um, the DNA result on the vertical axis versus the colonies that um, grew on agar plates um, that were extracted from peat. So extracted from peat and put on an agar plate or extracted from peat and measured using the DNA test. And what you can see is there's a, a nice correlation. Um, the DNA test is measuring um, accurately um, the numbers of rhizobium that were in those peats, um, certainly above a thousand cells per gram of peat. And um, once it goes below that, it starts to get a bit wobbly. Um, but above that level, it looks very good and many soils contain 10,000 up to 100,000 cells per gram. And we've also been doing some work about sampling strategies in the field. Um, so this is just uh, looking across the back of the ute. We we're actually sampling on and off the cereal rows in a, in a crop and then measuring the rhizobial numbers um, in, in those samples. And this is just a little bit of data from um, three sites. It's 27 paired samples on and off row. And you can see the copies of, or, or the results are telling us that there were about 20,000 rhizobia off row and 24,000 on row, which you might expect in the, in the rhizosphere of the, the cereal crop. Um, these paddocks had a, a history of legume in them. And so the recommendation will do, be to sample um, actually off row um, because that's going to give you a better indication of the lower level of rhizobium in the paddock. Just, uh, next slide. So we're currently um, calibrating the tests across a wider range of soils um, across South Australia and Victoria. Um, we have actually harvested some of the samples yesterday and the results look very encouraging at, at this stage. Um, but we do need to complete this process to be absolutely sure if we recommend not to inoculate that there is very little to no chance of a nodulation failure. Um, as I said, it's going very well. And at this stage, um, it looks like we will have a limited release of the EF rhizobia test through the Predictor B um, soil test platform, um, but not this season, but next season, 2021. So just stand by for that. And that will really be um, um, help you with your inoculation decisions, um, whether there's a background or not in the, the paddock. And it will also allow, um, be great support for the research program in, in able, being able to much more accurately and efficiently measure rhizobium numbers in soils. Beautiful, thank you, Ross. So that brings the uh, technical presentations to an end. Uh, this is where I would call for a big round of applause for our three presenters, Ross, Liz and Martin. A uh, big shout out to you and thank you for your time. Um, so I just would also like to say a big thank you to GRDC who are the investment partners for this project. Uh, you can see there's some really great uh, research going on and we're, we're thankful to be part of it. Uh, just for the last minute, I'd invite any of you to jump in our Q&A forum and put any of your unanswered questions through. But I did have just one, just while we're wrapping up. Could you please, uh, one of our speakers, just clarify 
what is the best sowing window for inoculated seed? It's our, it's our final question I've got, but I can take one more if anyone wants to get typing. Ross, you're unmuted. Are you going to tackle that one for us? I'll have yeah, a go. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit unclear about the question, Belinda, but I'll, I'll tackle it from two perspectives. I guess in terms of this, one interpretation of the, of the sowing window might be the time between inoculation and sowing the seed. Mm -hmm. And if that's the intent of the question, then um, fresh is always best. The closest you can um, get that seed into the ground after it's inoculated, the better, um, because that maximises the potential um, for nodulation because the cell numbers are very high in the first 48 hours after, after inoculation. And in the case I previously mentioned, if you're using freeze-dried inoculants, that window comes back um, to um, um, five or six hours, you know, to get it into the soil. You can't, they are effectively, it's a very high quality inoculant, but the, the, the cells are naked effectively, so they're, they're more sensitive to desiccation stress. So they need to be getting to the soil, into a moist soil quicker. If the alternative interpretation of that question is um, the time that a soil is dry, um, then obviously the less time um, the seed is in a dry soil, the better. So if you know rain is coming within a week, um, you look at the bureau site, you know you're gonna get a good break, um, then a peat inoculant applied at double rate is, is going to be just fine. Um, of course, as that time increases um, between the time the seed is sown and um, the, the breaker season, that the risk increases. And that risk will be dependent on, on soil type and things such as whether a, a fungicide has been applied to the seed um, or um, whether that, that seed is, is, that the soil is acidic. So it's going back to, to that table um, Liz showed, it's dependent on how many stresses you've got acting on the symbiosis at one time. But ideally, um, close to, so close to the break or into moist soil, that always optimises your, your chances of outstanding nodulation. Beautiful, thank you, Ross. With that, our webinar has come to an end. Our hour is up. Uh, thank you so much for your participation. It was great to see all of you stayed right through to the end. So hopefully we nailed the content for you. Uh, thank you again to our speakers, Martin Ryder, Ross Ballard, Liz Farquharson. I feel like I'm doing the Brady Bunch where I'm looking up and down at you all. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in the age of social distancing. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, for those participants who joined us today, again, please email us with any further questions or resources. We're always here, always happy to help and uh, look forward to working with you over the coming season. Um, hoping for a, a good year ahead for you all and wishing you uh, health and safety moving forward. Thanks again, Martin, Ross, Liz. Give us a wave goodbye, everyone. Thanks again. Thanks, Belinda. <laughs>